is. Okay, so the camera is up here. Wow, I'm not used to seeing myself all over the place. <laughs> yeah. well, we'll switch it over to the PowerPoint in just a second, so you're good. Um, so this is George Laufen, and he is here to talk to us about parallel computing, and as well as the uh, tell me the name of the collegiate. The collegiate cyber defense competition. Yeah, so cyber defense. So he's here to talk to us about both of those topics. Um, and this is for the computer science club. So I'm going to hand it over to him. And hopefully it all works. Hey, we haven't that. done this before. All right, here we go. I'll close this so I don't accidentally try to start <laughs> using it instead. All right. Cool. So um, I'm going to try something a little different. I've not done. Well, the second talk I've not done at all before, uh, but I've also never done this kind of combo thing. Um, so there were kind of two things that Elizabeth said you all might be interested in that I do. And the first one is kind of my day job, and the second one is one of the big things that I volunteer for. So we're, we're going to have kind of a dev and then ops double header today. Um, who I am is sort of the two hats for this. I'm the Associate Director for Research Computing Strategy at the Supercomputing Center at OU. Uh, and then I'm also the co-lead for operations for the Southwest Regional Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. So that'll be the, the second part. Uh, but we'll, we'll kick it off with the uh, parallel computing uh, talk. Um, subtitled, uh, Performing as if Architecture Matters because Performance is Your Job Now. I shamelessly stole that programming as if architecture matters subtitle from a, a talk that somebody else gave because I love it so much. Um, so parallel computing, doing parallelism on computers. That's about as far into the definition as we're going to get today. Um, as for parallelism, uh, hard word to spell, hard word to pronounce, doing more than one thing at once, or maybe doing the same thing on multiple sets of data at the same time. We're doing the same thing on the same data on different computers at the same time, or some combination or some, some other things. There's a, a formal way that we characterize parallel computers that's called Flynn's taxonomy. And this is the last time I'm gonna mention it today, but that's the thing to Google if you're interested in the theory behind the different kinds of parallel computers. <clears throat> this is really more of kind of a 40,000 foot intro motivation kind of talk. So why parallel computing? There's a few reasons, hey, hey, there's a few reasons uh, that we need to do parallel now. Uh, it's the only way we can possibly achieve computing performance goals. This is in like scientific and technical computing, right? We're looking at exascale, which means we're trying to get uh, quintillions of floating point operations per second uh, or exabytes. That's the scale we're gunning for right now in the sort of leader class, leadership class high performance computing systems. And then in the enterprise as in business applications, uh, parallel, lots of computers running all at the same time is the only way that we can achieve uh, business goals like transactions per second, number of concurrent users on a web service, things like that. Uh, the other reason that we do parallel computing is because it lets us get better cost per performance. It's much, much cheaper to buy lots of computers off the shelf than it is to custom build a single monolithic device for yourself. Uh, we also do uh, fault tolerance, right? So on the web, parallel is, is one of the ways that we achieve uh, fault tolerance, where if some link goes down, there's more than one server. Um, uh, spacecraft, uh, nuclear power plants all have multiple computers running the same calculations to make sure that the answers all match. <clears throat> and then when we're talking about simulation and modeling, uh, it makes sense to do things in parallel because the universe is inherently parallel rather than serial. Lots of things are all happening all at the same time. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but the thing I'm mainly going to talk about today is the, the high performance computing style performance goals that we're trying to achieve with parallel computing. Okay, so why is that the only way that we can get those exaflops, exabyte kind of, uh, kind of performance goals? Well, a funny thing happened in the year 2003. Uh, before 2003, single core processor performance, serial performance, was growing dramatically uh, exponentially. In 2003, that more or less stopped. Uh, starting in 2003, more or less, we don't make faster processors anymore. We make more processors. 
The reason behind this has to do with Moore's law or what Moore's law describes. Uh, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, uh, coined this years and years ago. Uh, we typically describe it as performance about doubles about every year and a half, two years. But the way that Gordon Moore actually described it is the number of transistors that it's possible to put into a dense integrated circuit tends to double about every uh, year and a half to two years. Uh, so it turns out that for decades that more or less tracked with performance. This is a log scale. The green line that looks more or less like a diagonal is transistors on processors. This is how many transistors we were able to pack onto a single die in a processor. And it's tracking more or less with Moore's law. We would expect this, uh, this nice diagonal line in this log scale. But then right around 2003, this funny thing happened. The dark blue is clock speed. The uh, light blue is power consumption, and the purple is performance per clock cycle. It all just basically leveled out in 2003. So to first order, single core performance is not getting better anymore. The reason this happened is we get smaller transistors, we can pack more in, we pack more in, and that was enabling us to have faster CPUs, but faster CPUs means they consume more power and more power consumption means more heat and more heat is very difficult to deal with. So that's why we stopped clocking them up anymore and we're just putting more and more uh, cores on every processor. So the result of that is now, say in 2000 or in 1998, if you wrote a serial program and it ran in 10 minutes, five years later, if you run that same program on newer hardware, you would expect it to run quite a bit faster because the computer is faster. That's not true anymore. I mean, it's sort of true, but not nearly to the degree that it used to be. Moreover, because this is what the hardware manufacturers can actually make, Everything's parallel hardware now, right? Phones are multi-core. There's, there's no way that you can achieve full performance of the full system without taking advantage of parallel hardware, without doing more than one thing at the same time. Uh, parallel hardware is fabulous for running lots of programs at once. It's great for general purpose computing, you know, lots of things going on at the same time. But let's say you've got a core business application or a video game or a big number crunching science code. Uh, maybe it's interesting that you can run eight or 16 copies of those at full speed simultaneously, but what you would really like is to run one of those as fast as possible, making use of all of the hardware that the system has available for you. And again, since 2003, we don't really get much year over year, single threaded performance for free. <clears throat> So the, the process of taking a serial code, one thing that happens after another, into a parallel code is called parallelization. Uh, my favorite book about this uh, describes that word as uh, something like, although we might wish for an easier to spell and pronounce word, this process is called parallelization. Uh, there's a, a lot of different ways that modern computers can do parallelism. Uh, the, the compiler and CPUs do a lot of instruction level parallelism and they, they take care of some things for you. Uh, aside from that, implicit meaning you basically write code as though it's normal and serial and uh, the compiler or language just magically takes care of making it parallel for you, doesn't always work very well. Uh, and when it does, you have to use bizarre languages like uh, I think Chapel does it, or you know, you can use um, Erlang or something like that. Uh, so really what we need to be doing is explicit parallelism. We need, as the programmers, to take control of what parts of the code run where. Uh, and by the way, there are tools that purport to automatically translate, say, a serial C program into a parallel one, but they don't work. <clears throat> okay, so the best case for performance when doing parallelization is to divide the work up exactly evenly among computing units while introducing absolutely no extra work. 
this doesn't really ever happen. When it does, uh, there's a there's a funny word for it. It's called embarrassingly parallel. Uh, and you know why is even division the best case? Well, it's because if you uh, if you have any core that's ever idle, that means there's work not being done on one of those, and it stretches out the amount of time that it takes. When you when you take a code that's serial and you make it parallel, uh, as you add computing units to it, the the ratio of speed in the parallel case to the serial case is called speed up. And there's there's different kinds of it. And the best case, which is this one, the uh, introducing no work and exactly evenly distributing the work among all computing units, that's called linear speed up. Unfortunately, doing parallelism almost always introduces extra work called overhead, uh, which is usually because you have to deal with content engine shared resources like storage or RAM, or uh, dealing with coordination, like figuring out which core does which work when and how it gets back to the master or whatever. Uh, you can also, you also talk about efficiency, which is kind of a complicated second degree concept here. <clears throat> Another important concept in parallel computing is Omdahl's law. Uh, most serial programs can't be fully parallelized. So if you envision a serial program as a, you know, as, a, as a line, this is the thread of execution that it takes. There's part of it that we can split up and part of it that we can't. And the part of it that we can't, we'll call the serial portion that just cannot be split up. It has to run on a single core. And the parallelizable portion is called the parallel portion. So here's a cool, really pixelated graph, uh, but, <laughs> Sort of using this diagram, you can kind of visualize how even in the case of perfect speed up for the parallel portion, as the number of cores that you have goes closer and closer to infinity, you're never going to get faster than the performance for just the serial portion. Which is an important concept, which uh, one of the things that we have to deal with sometimes at, at my job is convincing people that really running on eight cores is pretty much your best case. You, you could do it on 24 for a one and a half percent speed up, but then you're just using up resources that other people could for no advantage whatsoever. Uh, and, and another way to say this is that uh, as you, uh, as big parallel programs get more and more parallel, wider and wider, overhead can have a tendency to dominate. Uh, this is kind of related to scalability. So uh, if, a, if a program is scalable, it can handle ever-increasing problem sizes. Um, so a, a strongly scaling program means that I can run it on as many cores as I want without needing to increase the, data, the size of the data set. So if I've got uh, a thousand data points to process and I run it on five cores and then I run it on 10 cores and it, the speed about doubles, then that means I've got strongly scaling uh, code. Much more common is weakly scalable, which means that as you grow the number of computing units, you lose performance unless the problem size also gets bigger. <clears throat> and then here's some of the things that you'll see in, in the parallel computing world, depending on, on where you're at. If you're just writing on a, on a Linux or Unix or Windows machine, you'll see uh, fork and join or, or P threads, POSIX threads. Uh, in Windows, the, the multi-threading system is completely different than the way that it works in, in Unix. Uh, so all of the ways that in your operating systems class, if you take that, uh, that you talk about threading, none of that actually applies to Windows because it's totally different. Um, in high-performance computing, there's two main tools that we use for parallel computing. Uh, OpenMP, which is a set of extensions to the, they're actually built into the compiler for C and Fortran uh, that let you do multi-core processing. It lets you do uh, use lots of threads on the same machine. And then MPI, which is for, it it's, uh, stands for message passing interface, which you use to do distributed multi-processing. So parallel programs that run on lots of computers all at once, and MPI is the tool that uh, moves data in between the processes. Uh, and then there's some, some tools from the big data world like MapReduce and Spark, which are sort of uh, somewhat different models that involve uh, 
sort of moving the moving the compute to the data is what they like to say. And then in the enterprise, uh, you'll see things like enterprise service buses, which are, are ways of asynchronously passing um, messages between uh, services in a large scale uh, computing environment in a more interactive way than you normally see in supercomputing. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one final example that I I think is hopefully going to be helpful to understand what I mean when I say that we're pro you have to program as if the architecture matters, or rather programming for performance means that you have to understand the architecture of the system that you're working on and the nature of your problem as well. So here's a, here's a CS101 um, problem, right? Get in values and add them all together, right? So the Here's the super simple serial version, and I'm going to mix C and pseudocode uh, just to make it a little bit easier to follow. But right, so the serial version is uh, sum equals zero, and then for zero to n, compute the next value and add that to sum. Right. So let's say we wanted this to run on 20 cores instead of on a single one. So here's a here's a simple way to do it. This, by the way, is an approach called uh, single program multiple data parallelism, which means we'll run uh, lots of copies of the exact same code and assign each copy of it an ID. The one that's uh, the one that has ID zero, we'll call the master and the others uh, will just be the, the, the workers. So, okay, my sum equals zero. And then based on the ID of the, the core that we're running on, figure out the starting index and the ending index, right? That's a simple thing with addition and division and, and such. And then we'll do that same loop, except just for our, uh, our cores uh, IDs. We'll compute the next value and add it to the sum. OK. And so then for all of the worker cores, just transmit that sum to the master at the end. If you're the master core, then loop through all of the other cores and grab the, the sum from them, and then do that summation. So this works. Uh, perfectly fine, especially for small numbers of cores, but it's not scalable. So what if there's a zillion tasks? What if there's 10,000 cores that are running this, right? So not only does this summation potentially take longer than the action that all of the worker threads uh, take at the same time, but this has to run, this, this code in here has to run once for every core other than the master. So if you're trying to run this on 10,000 cores or 10,000 computers, then what you're gonna have at the very end of your number crunching is a summation step in which you've got 10,000 cores sitting idle for potentially hours if this is maybe a more complicated activity than just adding numbers together, <clears throat> in which case you're fired. <laughs> Because, uh, because 10,000 cores or 10,000 compute nodes is expensive, right? So you have to think about how to do this differently if you're talking at enormous scales where this kind of difference matters. Uh, by the way, here's the, um, here's the sort of right way, the textbook right way to do this, right? Where uh, core 0 and 1 compute their values, and then 1 sends its summation to 0, and 0 does that sum. So 1 is sitting idle at that time. But Zero still has work to do, and ditto for uh, for three, five, and seven. So it just sort of all uh, gathers. MPI has a has a function that just does that for you, so that you can efficiently make use of all of the cores. And there's still times that they're all sitting idle. It's not going to be perfect, but at least the summation happens in a way that closer to optimally takes care of uh, keeping all of the cores in use. Is that structure, is that something that you specify in code, or is that more architecturally? So it, MPI has a, um, so you can, you can do this totally manually if you want, right? Um, if, you're, if you're doing it in MPI, it has a function called all gather, uh, which, so gather just means on this rank, which means this mm -hmm. core, suck in all of these values from the others and perform some operation on it. Um, whereas if you do all gather, then it will automatically do this kind of distribution between all of the all of the ranks, all of the cores in the in the process. But you know, this is a this is a toy problem, and it's not necessarily the case that you're going to be able to use magic functions to, to do that in, in any kind of production code. 
So in, in a production setting, would you find yourself doing more investigation beforehand, knowing exactly what architecture you have available and planning it out, or is it? So first of all, yeah, um, premature optimization is the root of all evil, yeah. right? So first you have to decide if we care, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and for a lot of things, we don't, right? Yeah. We, Just run it. we don't care. Uh, human time is vastly more valuable than machine time. Right. Uh, so if it takes you, if it takes you 20 hours to write this to get a 10 minute performance benefit, right? How many times do you have to run the code in order to make up for that? A, a whole bunch. So it's just kind of, you know, you have to sort of think about what your, what your requirements are in terms of your time and the computing time and whether you've got available to you four core laptops, in which case all of this optimization for idle cores doesn't matter at all. Or if you're running on a, you know, 4,500 node supercomputer and you're expecting to do huge wide runs on that, then you really need to start thinking about extra stuff like including the network latency of passing, uh, passing those in between each other. But uh, and again, the most important thing is have working code because if you, uh, if you get a wrong answer faster, that's not helpful. <laughs> So yeah, that's basically that's basically this half. Um, because of what happened in 2003, uh, it really is up to us as programmers or people helping programmers in order to get uh, performance benefit, um, particularly on uh, big multi-core systems, on on big servers, on on big uh, high-performance computing environments. Um, and really, the important thing is to think about what your goals are and what kind of computer your code is, is going to be running on. And, and those are the things that you have to think about in order to achieve acceptable performance according to the goals that you have. So that's that one. How long do I have? You got, you have like 30 minutes. I have like 30 minutes. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. You're good. Now for something completely different. <laughs> So what do you, what exactly do you do at OU? So I'm, I'm an associate director at the supercomputing center. So I, I handle a whole bunch of different things uh, from helping design uh, HPC systems to doing user support with stuff like, you know, what I was talking about there. Let's figure out how to benchmark this code. Let's make it run faster. Let's figure out how many cores this should be running on. Uh, right now we're in the middle of an acquisition of a new Petascale storage system, uh, so I'm, I'm helping write the, uh, the RFP for that and handling the acquisition for that, and I'll be doing a lot of the evaluation of the bid responses, so uh, everything from that to writing grant proposals, and, uh, and a lot of it is doing stuff like this, coming, coming out to uh, classes and, and organizations and just talking about this stuff. Uh, I, I guess I should say, uh, if, you're, if you're involved in uh, project here, research-wise, or potentially even education-wise, uh, supercomputing resources are available at OU for free for any academic in the state. Uh, there's also an awesome system here called Buddy, um, which I'm not exactly sure what the rules are for getting time on it, but it's a, it's a cool system as well. So what were some classes that you took um, in your undergrad that were does anything come back to you like as you're working there, you're like, man, I'm glad I learned that. Or are there classes where you learned good core concepts? My my favorite answer to that question is, is networks. Um, I, I think there's a lot that flows out of um, uh, network fundamentals and network programming and things like that uh, to a great degree doing some kinds of parallel programming anyway, look just like doing network programming because you're talking about um, doing work, passing messages, coordinating, uh, you know, what goes where, when, making sure there's not deadlock or, or unmet dependencies or anything like that. So a lot of this parallel computing stuff actually looks a little bit like networking and networking turns out to be important for that too. So that's, that's something I'll always, uh, I'll always plug. As far as, you know, doing supercomputing, there's not a whole lot, even now that I'm aware of in a lot of universities that really teaches you how to do it but if you can if you can mess around with it if you've got access to some 
uh, spare hardware lying around and want to throw together a little Beowulf cluster, then that's a, a definitely a fun activity that'll it'll teach you a lot about whether that's something you're interested in or not, too. Right. So one last question on this, sure. and then we'll move on to the other stuff. Sure. Um, are there any resources or project bases that you'd recommend for people interested in getting into? Maybe if they wanted to see if they could work with Buddy, what should they, what kind of project should they develop? Or maybe just books that they should read? Um, so uh, for, um, for computer science students, for people who are interested in programming or interested in, in these kinds of concepts, uh, there's a book called Peter Pacheco, or a book by Peter Pacheco, and I forget the exact title, but it ha it's blue and it has a windmill on the front. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's called An Introduction to Parallel Programming or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's kind of one of those books where, um, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but as you get into more and more advanced classes, there's never such a thing as a textbook that starts with advanced. It's always an introduction to and then an increasingly specific or advanced topic. Um, so it's, it's not really a super introductory kind of thing. It goes into a good amount of depth, but it also starts, it's very accessible. So that's a, that's a good thing to check out. Um, there's a, a, I don't know specifically at UCO, but there's always uh, research projects out there who are in need of people who can code. Um, these days, we see a lot of folks in physics and in meteorology and in chemistry and uh, even in some humanities who are doing uh, work that involves big number crunching. And a lot of them are self-taught programmers. And as a result, the quality of the code and the performance is not necessarily what we want. <clears throat> so what's really helpful for a lot of those folks is to have somebody who has been trained in at least how to produce good quality code to come in and help and say, you know, no, you don't need those 17 assignment statements in the body of the for loop that do the same thing over and over and over again, right? <laughs> Uh, that kind of thing. So that's actually a lot of what we wind up doing with helping people, uh, at least for the folks who write their own code, is talking to chemical engineers who've put something together and just sort of picking out, okay, this is a strange thing that you're doing, traversing this array in a column major fashion. Um, turns out the way that cache works and the way that C works is if you, uh, if you traverse an array in a row major fashion first, you're going to get a whole lot more performance benefit out of the out of the way that the processor and the cache works. Um, so let's change that around. And sometimes it's you know, doubling or tripling your performance by switching which for statement is on the outside of the loop, um, which is not stuff that chemical engineering majors are necessarily taught to think about. Cool, so, uh, so this is the second one. Um, I've got a, a few minutes for, I think, uh, and I have a zillion slides, so if I skip things and, and jump around, that's why. Uh, also, this is, a, this is a brand new talk, so uh, forgive me for that. Uh, this is about the Southwest Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, which is something I'm super duper passionate about, which might be obvious given that I do an enormous amount of work for the competition for free. Uh, so, so here's a, here's a disclaimer. So starting now, I'm not in any way talking on behalf of the University of Oklahoma. I do work for the University of Oklahoma, but, but all of this is either me personally talking or on behalf of, uh, the Southwest Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. These were our sponsors last year. Um, so the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to give you just enough information about how the competition works so that you understand the words that I'm saying. Uh, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what the scenario was this year and kind of walk you through what it might have been like to participate in the competition that we hosted. Uh, so it's an annual cyber defense exercise for college students. Uh, the latest number I've seen is there's over 180 different schools that participate. Uh, our region was actually the original region that started uh, the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Uh, University of Texas at San Antonio created it in 2005, which was before the national organization got started. Uh, we are the current uh, host at the University of Tulsa. Um, 
since 2017. And there's, there's three elements to the competition. IT services, business and policy tasks, and a red team. One of the things that distinguishes CCDC from a lot of exercises that college students can get involved with, like capture the flag, is that it is 100% defensive. There's no offense whatsoever. And furthermore, there's no in-game interaction between the teams at all whatsoever. So uh, every team has an identical and independent environment from each other. Uh, and it's kind of like blackjack. Every team plays individually against the dealer, against this scenario, and they don't in-game interact with each other at all. The way I like to describe it is a team of eight students doing about 30 days worth of system administration and IT work in a weekend, while a professional team of hackers tries to screw them over. Uh, in, in my opinion and in my experience, it's the most realistic and the most valuable exposure to what it's like to be an IT ops professional that you can possibly get as a college student, possibly even up to uh, having internships doing the work uh, because you get a, a, a much less sanitized view of what it's like to be the one responsible for large uh, numbers of systems than you do in a super supervised internship. Uh, so this is, this is me from the perspective of CCDC. I'm the co-lead of the ops team for the Southwest region, along with my colleague, Brady Dietz, who works for the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. Uh, I was uh, one of the first members of TU's founding team uh, in 2007, which was the third year of Southwest CCDC. Uh, and I, I uh, was the captain of the team for the last three of the five years that I was involved. Um, my uh, undergrad and graduate work is from also from the University of Tulsa at the Institute for Information Security. Uh, basically, ever since I've been an IT professional, uh, a variety of roles. I'm not a full-time security practitioner, but I do uh, I do stay involved in, in the community and I do do security work with the, uh, with the role that I have now. Um, as black team lead, um, I'm responsible for basically everything that's involved in operations of uh, IT assets and, and systems at, at Southwest CCDC. I do a whole bunch of the big picture design of the scenario. I built about half of the uh, half of the machines and all of the network devices that were involved in the simulation last year. Um, I do a whole bunch of other stuff. And then I also probably wrote about, I didn't write, but I, I designed probably half of the business injects that we did last year as well. So the format looks like this. At the beginning of the season, uh, university puts together an up to 12 student roster. Uh, and from that roster over the course of the season, which means qualifiers, regionals, and potentially national, uh, you're allowed to form a different eight student team for each. Most teams keep the same eight student, eight student team. It's pretty typical to have eight team members and like two alternates or something. Uh, when you form a team, at most two grad students can be on it. Uh, and there's some rules about whether you're uh, a full-time student or your last semester and so on. Uh, and then there is a coach that's required as well. I would say probably half of all CCDC teams across the country, uh, their coach is more or less in name only, including probably Nationals winningest team, which is the University of Central Florida. They are 100% student led. They do have faculty that come because we require faculty to come with them, but uh, it's almost entirely led uh, by the students themselves. Uh, the, the first thing that we do, this is in the Southwest region, is we, we hold a remote one-day qualifying round. In 2018, that was on uh, Saturday in mid-February. We had 18 teams. It lasted about four hours. Uh, all that the teams have to provide is a room for them to work from, computers that have internet access, um, and uh, they have to work with us in about a week before the competition to make sure that they can get they can test their connectivity to our competition environment. We provide a virtual remote competition environment, the methods for remote access, uh, support, and, and the game. Uh, from qualifiers, eight teams advance to the Southwest Regional, which is an in-person event. The last two years has been held at the University of Tulsa. This season probably will be as well. Uh, we, we held it from uh, Friday to Sunday, the 23rd to 25th of March. Uh, earlier this year. It's two full days of competition. Teams are on the hook to provide a volunteer who's faculty or staff from their institution 
and to get there. Uh, historically, and this should be the case as well, we provide the venue for the competition, we provide all of the equipment involved, we provide the meals during the competition, and for the last two years, and again, hopefully this will continue, we provide the hotel rooms for all of the teams to stay at as well. So uh, all that, all that the teams are on the hook for really is gas money if they're from an institution that uh, doesn't have funding available for events like this. So even if it's a kind of last minute thing to be able to get together, this is something that uh, that we really try to make it accessible to teams from uh, even not particularly well healed institutions to make it to. So the rest of the rest of this I'm going to talk about regionals for because that's kind of the the fun one and, and regionals our format is almost exactly like uh, like the nationals format. So our regionals, is basically just a Southwest version of nationals. <clears throat> so you win or place by being the top three uh, scoring teams with the most points. Uh, we do little trophies and recognition for the top three and the one with the most points advances to nationals. Um, there's three things that affect your score. Uh, services, which you can use to gain or lose points. Uh, things called business injects, which you can use to get points and the red team who uh, can cause you to lose points. So when, when teams show up at CCDC, they have a room with some servers in it or some computers in them, which have a variety of pre-staged services running on them. Things like, well, in this case, DNS, there's an FTP server, um, mail, webmail, uh, webmail over HTTPS, a, a website, some, some things like that. Uh, they vary. Uh, every year, but there's some things that you can pretty much always expect. You can't have a network without TNS uh, and so on. So these are all working at the very beginning of the competition. And these services are checked every few minutes by a scoring engine that does these automatic checks against them. And for every successful check, you gain points. And points might vary for service. If you have long outages, it's possible that you can lose points from them. We don't normally do SLA's service level agreements, but we can turn them on. Uh, and Nationals does do service level agreements, which basically means if your web server is down for four hours, then you stop just not getting points. You actually actively lose points from that. Then there's these things called business injects, which are business tasks that show up. And they might be technical, they might be policy, they might be some combination. So uh, a piece of paper shows up, a memo shows up from your boss that says, make this network change that says, here's this laptop, I need it joined to the Active Directory domain and made ready for a new user, you've got half an hour. Um, here's 150 users that we need to be created, do these password resets, or it might be policy. So we had, a, uh, we had one last year where I think we had the teams, uh, they had about four hours to write an analysis of, the, of how GDPR and the new uh, European Union general data protection regulation impacted the company that they work for. Uh, or there might be a combination like um, stand up a VPN and write documentation to allow uh, uh, just a, you know, a secretary to be able to use it. Um, these are weighted and they're not all worth the same amount and you gain points for successful responses. We have rubrics for these, they get, they get graded. It's a massive pain to actually do the grading on these at the end of the day, uh, but uh, it's it's sort of really the heart of what makes CCDC what it is. And then there's a red team and they're trying to hack you. And uh, you lose points if they gain access to accounts. You lose points if they manage to steal company data. Uh, you lose points if they get into your systems. Uh, kick them out. And there's also a mechanism by which uh, you write incident reports. So if you identify and respond to uh, being hacked by our red team, then you can get some of the points back uh, by writing a detailed report about what happened and how you uh, responded to it. Okay, so now that you know all that, um, welcome to your first day on the job at the Crypto Casino. Um, so it's, it's Thursday, March 22nd, 2018. Uh, you're on your way into town. Uh, you're, uh, you're starting along with seven of your colleagues at a new job. You are the entire new IT department at a casino, uh, specifically Crypto Casino, the leader in blockchain gambling experiences. Um, you're informed that the previous IT department, all of them were all fired at the same time because of gross incompetence. They were terrible at their jobs. So good luck. 
<laughs> Here's what you get. We found this on the floor after the previous IT department was escorted, escorted out of the building by security. Uh, it's kind of like a network diagram. Uh, there's a lot of question marks. A lot of it might be wrong. Some IP addresses on it. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but this is what you have to, uh, to prepare for the competition. There's a to-do on it. Who knows what that means? <laughs> All right, so it's your first day. It is 9 o'clock a.m. Uh, the door is open and uh, prepared with nothing other than a found network diagram. You and uh, your seven teammates walk into a room in the morning of uh, Friday. Uh, it's a, This is from long ago, but you just walk into a room full of computers. You don't know much about what's going on here. This is actually from a practice round in 2011 that we ran at, at TU. This is more like what the equipment we use uh, these days looks like, and this is actually the current venue, uh, but this was our, our room where we staged it all up. Uh, okay, and you get in, and here's a, here's a plug guide that was from our, our documentation, but this is, a, this is an accurate description of what you'll see. There were, uh, what, what, there were eight physical computers set up in the room, a uh, combination of desktops and laptops, and, uh, and a big rack mount server sitting on a desk running, and then two switches. One of them is competition infrastructure and was totally off limits to any of the teams. Uh, and then there's a switch that uh, seems to be working right now. It's got one open port. Who knows what the ports are configured to do, uh, but that's the, that's the switch that, that you're allowed to manage, that, that you run as, as the team. So you're, you're looking around trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and you find a piece of paper that's got a username and a password on it. It's got a label on it that says craps. Uh, all these computers are labeled based on gambling games. Um, so, okay, we find this server. Uh, it looks like it's running VMware. We've got a username and password for it. Let's get in. Okay, we've got root access on this now. Now we can log in. Now we can grab one of the workstations that was logged in and we can connect to this machine remotely using the, uh, using the VMware tools. Uh, okay, and there's one VMware on, there's one VM on it, one virtual machine. It's called Bingo and it's running MonoWall, which is a decades old uh, firewall distribution. If any of you know about PFSense, it's the thing that was PFSense before PFSense existed. Uh, okay, so you're, you're messing around with that and uh, after just a minute you hear this really bizarre, horrible beeping noise. Oh no! Oh, there we go. <laughs> this goes on like every three or five minutes or so. There's like this beep boop beep boop boop that happens. Uh, they, you find a mute button on the machine but it doesn't do anything. Uh, you can turn the volume down, but that doesn't do anything either. It just keeps beeping, and, and this machine's labeled slot machine, incidentally. So I guess you've got to reboot it to, uh, to uh, force your way into it, reset a password, or you could guess the password, the username slot machine, and the password slot machine with the O replaced with a zero. Some of the teams <laughs> did that. Okay. Okay, so you're into the machine now. Uh, it's got this beautiful desktop on it, and it's got this uh, this console popped up. Again, adjusting the volume doesn't do anything. Muting it doesn't do anything. Uh, you figure out how to corrupt the audio driver, and that just makes the service start scoring down. Uh, so the, the thing isn't working. Killing the Python web service that's running here uh, makes it uh, makes it stop scoring up, which means clearly this is the thing that's getting scored on this machine. Okay, great. Well, I guess we're at least for now, going to have to resign ourselves to this as a noisy casino that we're working in. <clears throat> then we notice something. There's this light next to the camera that's on. Uh, and there's also a directory running in here. So users slash slot machine slash slot machine. And in there, there's a subdirectory <laughs> called surveillance. Uh, so this is a, a, a problem with casinos. There's a lot of noise, and they also have a lot of security cameras. And you open Open that directory up, and you find a whole lot of deeply unflattering photos of yourself. <laughs> well, you've got to figure that out. And then suddenly, there's a knock on the door. You've been in here only a few minutes. Uh, it's the first inject. Hello, welcome aboard. We know you're just starting today, and it's the first thing in the morning, but somebody else is starting today. Here's their laptop. We need this joined to the domain in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> we don't even know which one's the domain controller. <laughs> okay, well, let's figure that out. 
This was drawn by a team in, in 2017 on a, on a whiteboard. I, I like that a lot. <laughs> All right, so, so one of the machines looks promising. It looks like a server-ish Windows kind of thing. Uh, we don't know how to get into it, but okay, we find a sticky note. Uh, it's for a machine called Faro, which is apparently a type of gambling game. Uh, username is administrator and password is password with a zero and an exclamation point for security. <clears throat> so luckily we got into that, but unluckily this is all you get when you log in. So we find out that this is running Windows 2016 core, which means I hope you know PowerShell or can figure out how to install the uh, remote administration tools on a Windows machine. And you have access to Google, right? This is stuff that you can, you can figure out. You're just on a little bit of a timeline here. Uh, so, okay, you get into that, time passes. You find there's four Windows workstations in the room. They're called Craps, Roulette, Hold'em, and Pygal. Uh, okay, great, now we can Google stuff. We're into these machines. Uh, you figure out how to install, install RSAT tools, which are the remote admin tools for Windows. So now you've got a nice GUI on all of your workstations that you can use to manage Active Directory, now we can add users, manage them. We don't even have to know PowerShell to do that. Fabulous, we figured that out. Uh, but man, this firewall really stinks. Uh, so we figured out this firewall is a, it's, it's running off of a single cable coming out of our switch. It's running this almost 20 year old copy of this thing called MonoWall. It boots off of a virtual floppy disk drive. And by the way, if you reboot the, the VMware server, the firewall won't come back up because floppies don't automatically remount. Uh, but luckily you've got some money. <clears throat> Let's call up the store. Here's our, here's our store. Uh, there's lots of stuff you can buy. We've got, uh, you know, we've got uh, wired ethernet to USB connectors. We've got monitors, we've got keyboards, mice, USB sticks. Uh, but one of the things that we're also selling, because Palo Alto sponsored us last year, is we've got this beautiful PA3020 next generation firewall that you can bring in. And we've even got on-site support for it. They, they uh, sent us a, an engineer. Okay, so you get that, but you're working on installing this, this firewall and these injects are continuing to roll in. So 10 a.m., write a password policy. 11 a.m., uh, integrate email logins with Active Directory. 11.30, write an incident response policy. 1 o'clock, give web developer FTP access to the website. Sure, do you really want to do that? Well, you've got 30 minutes to figure that out. 2 p.m., you find out you're giving a presentation at 5 about a new enterprise storage solution that you're expected to, de uh, to design. 2 o'clock you got to write a patching policy. And now you've got to think about, well, I'm writing this password or this patching policy. Is the next thing they're going to ask me to do to implement this patching policy? So you better think about that. 2.30 p.m., prepare a report of the top 20 IT risks to crypto casino. You've got three and a half hours for that. By the way, the following day, we, uh, we made them address those and write a report about having done that. 3.15, add 100 users to Active Directory. At 3 o'clock, there was a mandatory all-hands meeting uh, <laughs> having, a, having a party in the, in the main room. Here's, our, uh, here's what our schedule of injects was. Uh, there was a whole lot going on all at once for these teams. Uh, I think my personal favorite was one that they had, uh, I think, 20 minutes to do at 4.15 p.m. on the last day, which was to block access to ESPN from the entire corporate network. <laughs> Did I see CEO root access? Yes. Very good. Yes, <laughs> the, CEO, the CEO decided that um, because administrator is the highest level of, of access, and he's an administrator, <laughs> that he absolutely has to have administrator level access to all of the computers. <laughs> So there's things like, and, and there are ways to get out of doing this. You just have to handle your boss correctly. So we have a, we have a guy who plays the CEO of the company who comes in and, and does these things. Okay, we got a join mail to Active Directory. Uh, that was a huge mess because the, uh, because the mail server wasn't actually a physical machine. It had been uh, physical to virtual onto a, onto a machine with VMware player running on it. And by the way, that didn't come back up if you rebooted that machine. 
um, which caught a couple of teams short. Uh, there's some other uh, other machines that are that are pretty fun. Turns out there's this guy named Dave Murphy who used to be the sysadmin there, and he really loves XFCE. He's got this machine that he had called Baccarat, which had everything installed in the world on it uh, with all totally default configs. He had every VLAN in the entire organization trunked to that machine. All of the all of this silliness is based on actual former former coworkers of mine at Brady's. <laughs> Uh, and so the, the other little wrinkle that we had was uh, your company has these laptops and you've got some employees who work on these laptops and sometimes they're on your network and sometimes they're at the coffee shop. Uh, so there were these VMs, they're joined to the domain, they're on your network to start with. You can access them from the domain controller, you can push group policy to them, you can get, you, you can uh, remote desktop to them, you can get right on them just like any other Windows machine in your environment. It's just that sometimes they decide to leave the company and go to the coffee shop, which was actually open Wi-Fi in a common area of the building that the red team had access to. Uh, there were some other fun things. We left some uh, uh, we left some fingerprints of Dave Murphy, aka Zero Cool, the former sysadmin all over. Uh, he changed the, the version of the DNS server to Zero Cool was here, LOL. Uh, he also wrote a custom PAM module on his workstation. Uh, we, had a, we had a focus on networking. So one of the things that you would find that tripped up every team was there were three different networks on private address, address spaces that you don't usually see very often with really goofy CIDR blocks, none of which started with a one. So there was no such thing as a dot one anywhere on the network. Nobody had any idea what to do with that. And so it was, it was fun watching people uh, pull up uh, CIDR calculators and, and so on. Um, one of the things that we got to do uh, with this networking focus was see how well teams were able to keep their actual network up. So this is a 24 hour graph of packet loss from my core router to one of the team's routers. Uh, when it's here, they're totally down. When it's up here, they're up. Uh, they were. This is a full 24 hour time span. This was not the worst team. This was the team with the best up time. This was Baylor, they won. Um, but uh, almost every team's looked like that. <clears throat> uh, so kind of really quickly, I've got a little bit more, but I'm out of time. So I'm, I'm gonna steal five more minutes and just go quickly through this if that's all right. Okay, okay cool. Uh, so one of the things that we found that good teams do um, and that they practice to do is they're good at talking to each other uh, they maintain inventories of everything they have. They, uh, they're on top of their firewalls. They have good uh, both ingress and egress rules. That means you keep stuff that doesn't belong from coming into your network, and you also keep the garbage that your stupid uh, employees have downloaded from phoning home to the hackers on its way out of the network. Uh, they, do, they put together network diagrams. They keep up-to-date documentation. They read documentation, they create documentation, they're well prepared, but are able to learn on the fly. All of these things, by the way, are not just what makes a good CCDC team, they're what makes a good team player in any IT operation. <clears throat> Here was the original design for our network. This is on a whiteboard in my living room. But this is the kind of thing that you need that you can generate quickly that lets you get a handle on a, a big thing that you're trying to figure out. This Ultimately, this took 15 minutes to draw, but is, is something that you can keep up to date and, and can, at a glance, understand what the shape of the network is. Okay, there's something I've left out with this whole summary so far. So we talked about services and injects. Uh, so I haven't talked about the red team yet. I really love team whiteboard art. Come on in, assets are free. And passwords. <coughs> So uh, our red team is led by Walmart's red team. So the, uh, the guy who is the director of penetration testing at Walmart is also the guy who's in charge of hacking teams at, uh, at our competition. So I think this year we had about a 30 person red team. Uh, some of them were remote, some of them were local. This is their pwn board. Uh, I don't understand why the team numbers were all screwed up, but this basically was uh, their map of which machines there are and which ones they have uh, uh, they have an agent on, which was all of those. 
Uh, they were able to get into the coffee shop laptops pretty quickly. Um, from there, uh, they were actually able to pivot from those into the internal networks. So they got Mimikatz on all of those. That was pretty cool. This is Cobalt Strike, which is a co-sponsor of National CCDC. It's a, a hacking tool. Um, they got, uh, it, I don't know if you know what golden tickets are, but uh, it, they got one on every single domain controller on every single team. Uh, one team, not the winner, actually managed to kick them out for good at the end of the last day. But everybody else, they completely owned their entire Windows environment basically the whole time. So uh, it's a it's a Kerberos ticket granting ticket is what it is. And basically, you can compromise this one service account and it basically lets you do whatever you want in a, in a Windows environment. Um, we had wide open zone transfers, so they were able to just pull out uh, pull out all DNS information. So they got to quickly uh, quickly inventory machines on networks that way. Uh, and then I'm lucky enough to be on their Slack, which they use to coordinate. Uh, this is them figuring out the service running on the slot machine. And one of them said jackpot code. LOL, it makes a sound every time we send a request. <laughs> Uh, and also, there was a also there was a shell uh, a shell injection vulnerability in this. Uh, but as a little aside, I left a little trap for them because it's running as though it's a Linux service, but it's running on SigWin on Windows. So they spent about an hour banging their heads against the wall trying to trying to do Linux exploits against this Windows machine. And one of them finally, with a lot of profanity, said, "It's SigWin." <laughs> <laughs> so they found the webcam. Um, all of these are, are, are pulled from Twitter, by the way. They, uh, they had a pretty fun thread. Uh, let's see. University of Tulsa, Texas, San Antonio, Baylor. Uh, I think this was University of New Mexico. Uh, one team finally figured it out and covered it up. They weren't able to shut it down, but they covered it up. One of the teams put tape over all of the webcams at the very beginning. Uh, somebody fell asleep right in front of... <laughs> Uh, right in front of the surveillance machine. And uh, I, I saw the uncensored version uh, and it looked like he was just blinking, but then you look at, you know, about a five minute time span and he was asleep in front of the computer. Uh, one team patched slot machines shell injection vulnerability. Uh, they were a little rude about what they did there. F off red team. You can kind of see, if you can see that, you can kind of see what they're trying to inject. So, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to do some PowerShell exploits there. Uh, the last little bit of fun, and this really annoyed most of the red team, was at one point they figured out how the sound maker was working on the, uh, on the slot machine. And Tim, the red team lead, sat down with his laptop. Uh, they pulled a copy of the Python script that makes the noise off of the machine because it has a shell injection vulnerability. So they got it and they just copied and pasted it so they could. And so he started running it locally so he could sort of figure out different songs. And then they then he he wrote this for loop or this while loop, one of these running for every team uh, that just <laughs> looped through various different of these. <laughs> I mean, he was kind of nice. It tended to go one room, then the next room, then the next room, then the next room before it, it looped over again. Most teams, uh, by the end of the first day, figured out how to shut the slot machine up, which was really what it was. It wasn't supposed to be a horrible distraction wanting to rip your ears out for the whole competition. It was just supposed to be a little a little joke to, to work your way around. And the red team loved this. And the nice thing for the teams is every minute that Tim wasted trying to figure out how to do never going to give you up on this horrible little Python uh, web service was a minute that they weren't spending actually messing with teams. Oh, no. Uh, so team signups for this year have not opened yet. There's a few more months before they, or about two months before they even open. Um, this is, like I said, I think the most, looking back at college, probably the most fun thing that I ever did. Uh, goodness knows I, I wouldn't have, have come back to do it as a, as a volunteer running operations for it if I didn't. Uh, and by the way, actually putting the competition on is a lot like playing, except about eight times harder. 
Um, but you can you can follow us at uh, SWCCDC on Twitter. Uh, if you're willing to stomach the amount that I post about college football, you can follow me on Twitter. I'll be talking a lot about Southwest CCDC in the in the months to come. Uh, SouthwestCCDC.com is a website. Like I said, um, team signups start mid to late November. We don't have that exactly figured out yet. Uh, the way to put together a team for this, find some friends who think this sounds like fun. Uh, find somebody at your institution who's willing to at least commit to make the trip with you. One thing that we've seen is that uh, a lot of uh, professors who are willing to do it but aren't super excited about it will, if the team makes it to regionals and they can sit there and watch how the entire competition unfolds, will get super excited about it uh, once they're actually there and it'll really jazz them up and that helps a lot. Uh, but like I said, many of the teams, even the most successful ones, are totally student run and it's basically just a warm body that they get from the, the faculty or staff at the institution. Um, find some machines, put some operating systems and services on them, start practicing, play around with it. One thing we're doing new this year in November or so, we, we want this to be available right when signups open, is we're going to put together a very small practice environment that teams can download and run on VirtualBox or VMware Player or something like that. It's not going to be huge. It's probably just going to be one or two virtual machines with a PDF of some uh, inject-like tasks to do, but it'll still let you get the feel for what, what it'll actually take to do this stuff. So we'll have that ready for this year. Uh, and then uh, I should have said this earlier, the URL for these slides, which are up, I think, already or will be soon if they're not currently. Uh, here's some some neat stuff that's, that's helpful for this. Uh, Nationals puts out a team prep guide. It's a little dated. Um, there's a... <clears throat> $10 ebook called the Blue Team Field Manual that's kind of a, a quick hits for system hardening and, and uh, uh, secure sysadmin type stuff. Uh, and then a, a handful of other things. The MITRE ATT&CK framework is relatively recent. It's a knowledge base and framework for adversary behavior. It's really good uh, for um, security policy stuff. The SANS Institute has a policy project and repository of example information security policies. So for all of this stuff that you need to know, you can pull together and you can pull together a successful team in, uh, in a couple of months uh, to at least make a good run at the qualifying round if that's something that appeals to you. And like I said, it's the best possible experience if you think you wanna go into IT operations or if you don't know, You'll find out in a hurry. <laughs> That's all I've got. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, great. thanks for having me. Sorry, yeah. to, sorry to run over. No, that's fine. I appreciate it. I know our team will like it too. They're doing um, after the flag, but yeah. knowing both sides of this is it's, helpful. It's sort of the opposite. CTFs are, I've, I've never really done serious.